By the late 1930s, the race for air superiority wasn't decided by who built the fastest airframe or the most maneuverable fighter. It was decided by what hung on the firewall, the engine that turned engineering theory into combat dominance. Britain chased reliability through elegant complexity. Germany pursued automated perfection. America bet on indestructible brute strength. Japan gambled on lightweight efficiency. Each nation's philosophy shaped every dogfight, every bombing raid, and every pilot who trusted their life to thousands of precisely machined parts spinning at lethal speeds. The Rolls-Royce Merlin began quietly in 1933 as a private venture when most of Britain still believed 600 horsepower engines and biplanes were adequate for modern warfare. Senior engineer Arthur Rowledge and aero engine manager Ernest Hives understood what was coming, faster, heavier aircraft where altitude and power would decide everything. They started a secret project funded from their own budget to build an engine that could evolve faster than the war itself, calling it PV-12 for Private Venture 12 Cylinders, and the prototype ran for the first time on October 15, 1933, producing a sound that made mechanics stop their work just to listen to the 27-litre liquid-cooled V12 with its single-stage supercharger that would become the foundation of British air power. At first, the Air Ministry showed little interest, but early test results were so impressive that even bureaucrats noticed, and in 1935, the PV-12 received its operational name, Merlin. The name proved perfect small, fast and lethal like the Falcon, and two fighters were already being designed around it. The Hawker Hurricane and Supermarine Spitfire, and that coincidental timing changed the entire course of the air war because both aircraft would define Britain's defence during its most desperate hour when the Merlin's reliability would matter more than raw performance specifications. Early production Merlins produced approximately 1,030 horsepower on 87 octane fuel, adequate for the Battle of Britain but insufficient for the evolving war. The engines suffered from problematic float type carburetors that cut fuel flow during negative G maneuvers, meaning British pilots couldn't push forward into dives without their engines dying. A potentially fatal limitation when German BF109s with fuel injection could dive freely, until engineer Beatrice Tilly Schilling largely solved the problem in 1941 with a simple brass restrictor and true pressure carburetors followed in 1943, finally giving RAF pilots the freedom to maneuver without fear of engine failure. But the Merlin's true genius was its capacity for evolution. As the war progressed, Rolls-Royce engineers continuously refined the design. The Merlin 20 arrived in 1940 with a two-speed supercharger giving pilots low and high altitude gears, and then genius engineer Stanley Hooker redesigned the supercharger into a two-stage intercooled system that transformed the Merlin 61 into a 1,565 horsepower powerhouse, maintaining full power to 25,000 feet. And when the Spitfire Mark IX appeared with that engine, the balance of power over Europe shifted overnight proving that continuous refinement could keep an engine competitive far longer than its original design suggested. By 1943, American industry had joined production through Packard Motor Company, which built Merlins under license as the V1650 with the kind of precision interchangeability that only American manufacturing could achieve. One of those Packard-built Merlins ended up in the North American P-51 Mustang, and that pairing changed the war completely. A fighter that had been mediocre at altitude became the fastest, longest-ranged escort of the war, capable of taking bombers all the way to Berlin and back, proving that sometimes the perfect engine-airframe combination creates capabilities that neither component could achieve alone. By war's end, the Merlin had roughly doubled its output from 1,030 to over 2,000 horsepower in some variants with only modest weight increases. 
Approximately 168,000 engines were built across Britain and the United States, powering everything from single-seat fighters to four-engine bombers like the Avro Lancaster. And the engine's genius lay not in revolutionary technology, but in methodical refinement, each variant addressing previous limitations while maintaining the fundamental reliability that made it trusted by pilots who flew it into the most desperate battles of the war. Britain's pursuit of reliability through elegant refinement had created an engine that won the Battle of Britain and escorted bombers to Berlin. The Allison V-1710 was America's first modern liquid-cooled fighter engine. A 12-cylinder V configuration built on principles of strength and simplicity rather than sophisticated complexity. Development began in the late 1920s when Allison engineers in Indianapolis were experimenting with airship and racing engines. The U.S. Army Air Corps wanted a homegrown V-12, and by 1933 had officially backed development of the V-1710, a 1,710 cubic inch, 28-litre V-12 designed for continuous operation at full throttle, conceived as a production engine from day one with every component designed for mass manufacturing rather than hand-tuned craftsmanship. The first V-1710 ran in 1936 a 60-degree V12 with single overhead cam per bank, four valves per cylinder, and a gear-driven centrifugal supercharger. By 1939, the Allison was powering prototypes that would become legends, the Lockheed P-38 Lightning, Curtis P-40 Warhawk, Bell P-39 Aero Cobra, and the first P-51 Mustangs before their Merlin transplants, and each aircraft revealed both the engine's brilliance and its fatal limitation. At low altitude, the V-1710 was superb with smooth power delivery and nearly indestructible reliability, but climb above 15,000 feet, and its single-stage supercharger ran out of breath with power falling off brutally. Allison's engineers had anticipated this limitation, they designed the engine to accept exhaust-driven turbochargers. In the P-38 Lightning, whose long twin booms provided room for massive General Electric turbochargers, the combination worked spectacularly with Allison's producing over 1,400 horsepower at 30,000 feet, proving the V1710's fundamental design was sound. But in single-engine fighters like the P-39, P-40 and early P-51, there was no room for turbocharger installations, and without that assistance, the Allison gasped at altitudes where Merlin-equipped fighters dominated. Yet the V1710 had combat virtues. It was phenomenally tough, capable of absorbing battle damage that would destroy delicate engines. Field mechanics loved it because you could replace cylinder banks in hours with basic tools, and in deserts and jungles, that reliability was invaluable when P-40s returned with missing cylinders, but the Allison still turning, and the Soviets understood this perfectly, on the Eastern Front where combat occurred below 15,000 feet. The P-39 Aerocobra's V-1710 was ideal, running on rough fuel and taking endless abuse, and Soviet aces swore by it, proving that when operated within design parameters, the inadequate American engine was superior to European alternatives in specific conditions. America's pursuit of simplicity created an honest engine limited by doctrine, not design. But if you think the Allison was tough, Wait until you see what Pratt and Whitney built, a radial so indestructible it became the stuff of legend hit subscribe, because this next engine survived abuse that would destroy anything else flying. The Pratt and Whitney R-28000 double WASP was American engineering at its most uncompromising, an 18-cylinder, two-row radial the size of a beer barrel that powered half the US arsenal through philosophy of indestructible reliability over refined elegance. By the mid-1930s, Pratt and Whitney engineers faced a brutal challenge. Build an engine delivering 2,000 horsepower without self-destructing. 
The result was the R2800, about 53 inches in diameter, over 80 inches long, and weighing approximately 2,360 pounds. An engine that looked like a steel bulldog with a propeller and didn't care about elegant appearance because it was engineered for war, not beauty. Unlike European liquid-cooled V12s that prioritized streamlined profiles, the Double Wasp was unapologetically massive. Each of its 18 cylinders was a forged steel barrel with aluminum head shrunk and screwed on, air-cooled through deep fins that eliminated radiators, coolant lines, and everything fragile that enemy fire could puncture, and you could hit it with shrapnel, lose an entire cylinder, and it might continue running because redundancy was built into every system with dual magnetos, dual spark plugs, and backup systems for the backup systems. First production models produced approximately 1,800 to 2,000 horsepower, but the real genius wasn't raw output. It was reliability under the worst conditions. Pratt and Whitney didn't chase perfection. They chased survival, designing every component to withstand heat, combat damage, and mass manufacturing, creating an engine that prioritized function over form, and by 1941, the R2800 was powering frontline Navy aircraft like the Vought F4U Corsair and Grumman F6F Hellcat, and suddenly, carrier aviation had engines that simply refused to quit over Europe. The same engine powered the Republic P-47 Thunderbolt, a seven-ton fighter whose R280 combined with an exhaust-driven turbocharger created phenomenal power at 30,000-plus feet. When P-47s dove, they descended like divine retribution with speeds exceeding 500 miles per hour, and through every violent maneuver and extreme condition, the double wasp kept spinning with mechanical indifference to abuse that terrified German pilots who couldn't believe American fighters survived damage that would destroy anything the Luftwaffe flew, and with water methanol injection, late war variants reached 2,500 horsepower while maintaining legendary reliability. Ability. When the BMW 801 first roared into combat in 1941 powering the Focke-Wulf FW190, it proved that Germany had finally cracked the radial engine code. The 14-cylinder, 41.8-litre twin-row radial was air-cooled, compact and ferociously powerful, producing approximately 1,560 horsepower in early versions and eventually reaching 2,100 horsepower with emergency boost. Most German fighters ran liquid-cooled V12 that were precise, efficient and vulnerable to battle damage. But BMW deliberately chose the radial path because it eliminated fragile radiators and coolant systems. And for a brief period after the FW190's debut, the Luftwaffe ruled European skies again with a fighter that could match the Spitfire Mark V. But the BMW 801's real revolution wasn't in the cylinders, it was in the control system. The engine used an ingenious mechanical device called the Commando Gerate. Essentially an analog computer built from gears, cams and pneumatic lines that automatically adjusted fuel mixture, propeller pitch, manifold pressure and supercharger gear selection. The pilot had one simple lever, push forward for more power, pull back for less, and the Commando Gerate handled everything else automatically. And this was decades ahead of contemporary engine control technology, where pilots manually managed multiple systems simultaneously, and the single lever operation made the FW190 extraordinarily easy to fly compared to the BF109. The 801 also featured sophisticated fan-assisted cooling. BMW mounted a large 10 or 12 blade cooling fan forcing air through tight ducts over the cylinders. This allowed the entire engine to sit behind a streamlined cowling that gave the FW190 an impossibly clean nose for a radial-powered fighter, making it one of the fastest aircraft at low altitude in 1941-42, and the combination of automated controls and efficient cooling represented German engineering at its most ingenious. But genius built on fragile foundations fails catastrophically. 
The commando gerate was extraordinarily delicate, hating dirt, heat, vibration, and neglect, all conditions that Eastern Front combat provided abundantly, and minor contamination could send the system into chaotic behavior with jerky throttle response and fluctuating boost pressure. And even when working perfectly, the BMW 801 single-stage supercharger ran out of breath above 20,000 feet where American bombers operated, making it a superb low-altitude fighter in a war that had moved to the stratosphere Germany's automated genius couldn't overcome its environmental limitations. And Japan's final engine reveals why brilliant engineering means nothing without industrial capacity. Subscribe now because this last story shows how desperation and declining resources turned power into tragedy. By 1941, Japan understood that the elegant Sakai engine powering the legendary Zero wouldn't be enough for the evolving war. American bombers were flying higher, faster, and heavier than anything Japan had faced, and Mitsubishi's engineers recognized a harsh truth. Lightness couldn't win a heavy war. What Japan needed wasn't poetic efficiency, but raw muscle. And so they built the Kinsei, the Mars, a 14-cylinder radial that tried to trade Japan's traditional philosophy of minimal weight for the brute power that modern warfare demanded, and it would become Japan's most widely used heavy radial engine, powering medium bombers and late-war interceptors. The Kinsei began development in 1938 as an ambitious scaling up of proven technology. Mitsubishi's engineers essentially took the Sakai's philosophy and stretched it until the metal screamed, targeting 1,500 horsepower, nearly double the Sakai's output, from a compact air-cooled twin-row radial. It displaced 42 litres with bore and stroke of 150 mm by 170 mm that created long, heavy piston travel generating tremendous torque but punishing bearings and oil films under sustained high-power operation and early Kinsei variants made approximately 1,530 horsepower going into the Mitsubishi G4M Betty bomber, giving it range Allied forces couldn't match initially. The real breakthrough came in 1942 with the Kinsey 21, featuring a two-speed supercharger producing 1,850 horsepower at takeoff. It powered later Betty variants, the Kawanishi H8K Emily flying boat, and most importantly interceptors like the J2M Raiden Jack, where variants delivered up to 1,820 horsepower with water methanol injection, and suddenly Japan had fighters that could climb fast enough to reach B-29 superfortresses destroying Japanese cities, though performance fell off above 30,000 feet where American bombers operated most effectively. But with increased power came devastating consequences. Higher boost pressures pushed the Kinsey's temperatures beyond its aluminum alloys limits, Already inferior to American materials due to limited access to high-quality metals, cylinder heads cracked under thermal stress, oil seals failed, and engines seized in flight with catastrophic regularity. And by 1944, Japan was losing resources as submarines strangled supply lines and bombing destroyed infrastructure, and factories using adulterated alloys and recycled bearings produced engines that failed violently and unpredictably, proving that even brilliant design cannot overcome industrial collapse. Five engines, five philosophies. Britain's evolving reliability, America's honest simplicity and indestructible strength, Germany's automated genius, and Japan's powerful tragedy. Each represented its nation's approach to warfare through the mechanical hearts that powered their aircraft. The most powerful engine wasn't measured only in horsepower, but in reliability, production capacity, and how well it matched the war its nation fought. Watch the next video on Heritage Planes for more untold stories.